Solving cold cases is something that is no longer the domain of just government authorities. They are also aided by internet detectives who have devoted many hours, words and postings to solving long forgotten cold cases. As it turns out, the hive mind is rather adept at playing detective, but the following are some of history's most perplexing cases that, despite the greatest efforts of professionals and amateur internet sleuths alike, keep puzzling us. Who Burnt Alive the East Dal Woman? In 1970, at the height of the Cold War, a burnt body of a lady was discovered in a remote part of Norway. She had taken sleeping drugs ingested carbon monoxide and had been burned alive, according to an autopsy. Luggage belonging to the woman was later discovered, containing money from several different countries. She was eventually detected traveling around Europe with several fraudulent passports using various aliases. A family trekking in the East Dal Valley near Bergen in western Norway came across the woman's burnt body. She was badly burned in the front and discovered with her hands lifted to her chest in a defensive stance. Personal items such as a watch, an umbrella, some jewelry, and many empty bottles were strewn about the body. Authorities believe the things were unusually positioned around the body, almost as if they were part of a ceremony. Her clothes were composed of synthetic fibers and didn't have any tags on them. Initially, it was assumed that she was in her 30s. She had eaten between 50 and 70 tablets of phenobarbital and had bruises around her neck. She had also breathed carbon monoxide and soot, indicating that she had been burned alive. Her death was considered suicide by Norwegian officials due to the lack of identifying documents and the presence of a substantial amount of sleeping tablets in her system. A few days later, a pair of luggage containing fingerprints matching the murdered woman was discovered at a train station in Bergen. Inside were wigs, makeup, clothing, eczema ointment, non-prescription eyeglasses, maps, and small sums of money from Norway, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and Belgium. 100 Deutsche Marks were also hidden inside the case's lining. Any identifying information had been disconnected cut out or rubbed off. Even the eczema cream, which usually included the name of the prescribing doctor on the packaging, couldn't provide a clue. The sophisticated dental work of the Isdal woman was unheard of in Norway at the time. According to stable isotope research of her teeth, she was born in Nuremberg and grew up on the German-French border. Inside the luggage, the investigation detectives discovered a shopping bag, which they used to track out the woman's movements before she died. She had visited Norway numerous times over the year, staying in various hotels using counterfeit passports and false aliases. According to a 2017 investigation, she claimed to be Claudia Teald from Brussels at one hotel. She was Elizabeth Lean Hofer from a stand in another. People who interacted with her were eventually tracked down and interviewed. They all spoke of a gorgeous, stylish woman with black hair and brown eyes who was attractive, pleasant, and only paid in cash. She also wore wigs, spoke numerous languages, including French, Flemish, and English, and seemed tense most of the time. Years later, the Norwegian National Defense released information indicating the woman may have been traveling around the country watching the testing of the top-secret anti-ship penguin missile. A fisherman had noticed a woman following the movements of Norwegian army troops. Is there any logic to the spy story? During the Cold War, Norway was a hotspot in the early 1970s. It not only shared a border with the Soviet Union, but it also assisted the United States and the United Kingdom in monitoring Russian nuclear testing and submarine warfare. Russian intelligence assets, as well as components from the CIA, MI6 and Mossad, were known to be present in the country. After seeing a sketch of the Isdal woman in 2005, a man from Bergen came forward. He reported seeing a person matching her description, hiking on a hillside approximately an hour away from Isdal, five days before her body was discovered in 1970. She was dressed inappropriately for the weather and was being pursued by two males who looked southern, according to him. He told the cops what he observed, but they dismissed his claim. 
A section of the lower jaw of the Isdal woman was removed and saved before she was buried. Her teeth showed traces of extensive dental surgery, which was unusual for Norway at the period. In 2017, a stable isotope examination of her teeth revealed that she was born in Nuremberg around 1930 and grew up near the French-German border. Her dental work was found to have been done in Central Asia, East Asia, Southern Europe, and South America. The case continues to pique people's interest. In 2018, the BBC World Service and the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation released a podcast called Death in Ice Valley, which delves into the death of the Isdal women in great detail. While the stable isotope study provided answers to some concerns, such as the woman's age and birth country, many more remain unanswered. Was she a saboteur? If that's the case, who killed her and why? Who was she employed by? What's more, why haven't any of her friends, family, or loved ones come forward? This is a case that might remain shrouded in mystery forever. Ricky McCormick's Last and Only Cipher Ricky McCormick was discovered dead in a cornfield in West Alton, Missouri on June 30, 1999. Two pages of the handwritten notes in McCormick's front pocket included a complicated cipher that the FBI, the American Cryptogram Association, and countless amateur code breakers have yet to decode. According to a family relative, McCormick was a high school dropout who could not write and code. He couldn't spell a word and could only doodle. Authorities had to use fingerprints to make a definitive ID because McCormick's body had been rotting in the field for several days before being discovered. Even after an autopsy and a toxicology report, medical examiners struggled to pinpoint a cause of death due to the rate of the composition. However, detectives classed his death as a homicide after considering the suspicious aspect of where his body was discovered as the region has previously been used to dump murder victims. The two notes discovered in McCormick's pocket had 30 lines of seemingly random letters and numbers on them. Some of the code is enclosed in parentheses, while others are circled. McCormick was an ex-con who worked part-time at a gas station and went back and forth between staying with relatives and living on the streets. He also had heart and lung problems and was receiving disability benefits at the time of his death. He had a slew of offenses on his record, as well as a spell in prison for statutory rape. Even though McCormick did not own a car and public transportation did not serve the region where he was discovered, his body was discovered 50 miles from his home. According to his ex-girlfriend, McCormick traveled by bus to Florida sometimes where he allegedly served as a courier for drug dealers, transporting marijuana back to Missouri. McCormick's mental state has been the subject of various reports. McCormick's public attorney claimed he was suffering from some mental sickness or defect while awaiting trial for statutory rape. They had him evaluated by a local psychologist who determined that McCormick was mentally capable of standing trial. McCormick was described as street smart, with an active imagination and a naive childlike attitude toward the world, while never having been diagnosed with any mental illnesses. McCormick's fiance reported a few days before his death that he was agitated and apprehensive after returning from a cocaine smuggling job in Florida. In the days leading up to his death, he visited various hospitals for treatment of chest problems and asthma. Some investigators believe he wasn't asking for medical help, but rather a safe place to remain since he feared his life was in danger. The FBI's Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit had spent all of its efforts cracking the encryption by 2011. In a 2011 statement, the FBI stated, Breaking the code could expose the victim's whereabouts before his death and potentially lead to the solution of a homicide. According to some family members, Ricky had been writing in code since he was a child. The notes are said to be real by experts, including the FBI agent in charge of the case. Small characteristics in the handwriting, such as circles around sections of the code, suggest it was a personal document, potentially a to-do list. According to the FBI, the most difficult aspect of this case is that McCormick most likely wanted the notes to be read only by him. 
Unlike him, other well-known ciphers, such as the Zodiac Killer, wished for their codes to be solved at some point. Of course, there's a chance McCormick didn't develop the code. Specialists haven't been able to establish the notes are in his handwriting decisively. It's also possible that the code was developed for him by the drug traffickers for whom he worked, or that he was simply carrying the cipher from one location to another without realizing its significance. The FBI has set up a website dedicated to the case, inviting amateur code breakers to participate in the investigation. Ultimately, it is thought that the code contains information that will aid in the capture of McCormick's killers. Murder in the Vatican Emanuela Orlandi was born and raised in Vatican City, the Pope's residence and a major tourist destination. She was on her way home from a flute lesson on June 22, 1983 when she vanished. She called home later that evening and spoke with one of her sisters, but her family never heard from her after that. Orlandi was last seen at a bus station in Rome city center before disappearing forever. In July 2019, Forensic researchers discovered a strangely empty crypt while searching for Orlandi's remains. Since 1983, the Orlandi family has been following leads concerning Emanuela's disappearance, which has taken them down some unusual paths. They petitioned the Vatican in 2019 to gain access to Princess Sophie of Hohenlohe's grave, which she died in 1836. In an anonymous letter, a source directed them to the tomb and they opened two burial sites where Orlandi's remains were allegedly buried. There was no trace of Orlandi or anyone else when the experts opened the tomb. Although no one had been inside the tomb since 1836, it was evident that something unusual had occurred. There were no human skeletons or burial urns to be found. The Vatican had anticipated finding two tombs, but not two empty tombs. They were absolutely bamboozled. The Orlandi family has had to deal with a slew of bizarre tips and suspicions concerning Emanuela's whereabouts. The evidence varies from hearsay to cryptic musings, all of which raise more questions than they answer. Pietro Orlandi has received a plethora of information concerning his sister, and he is prone to following up on any leads he has provided, no matter how bizarre they may appear. Emanuela Orlandi's family has heard every explanation about her disappearance. Many of the tips they get come from people who think they saw her in a crowd, but the details seem more like movie plots than real-life scenarios. Regardless of how bizarre some of these leads are, the family investigates them in the hopes of learning more about Orlandi's disappearance. In 2008, Sabrina Minardi, who dated mobster Enrico de Pedis, claimed that Orlandi had been kidnapped by American Archbishop Paul Marchinkus, the former president of the Vatican Bank. But it's unclear why he allegedly wanted her off the streets. Marchinkus died in 2006, and despite his involvement in an Italian banking crisis in the 1980s, no allegations of kidnapping or child endangerment were ever made. The Vatican simply stated that Minardi's claims came from a source whose value is exceedingly doubtful. Some have claimed to have seen Orlandi alive over the years. The Orlandi family is still hoping to find Emanuela alive after three decades of searching, no matter how unlikely it seems. Some of those who claim to have seen Orlandi believe they've run into her on the street, with tales coming in from as far as Turkey and England. Others, on the other hand, appear to be more interested in personal gain. An anonymous phone call was made to a television show about Orlandi's disappearance in 2005, alerting the family to a local mobster's tomb. To solve the case, go see who's buried in the crypt of the Basilica of Santa Polinari. The caller stated, referring to the burial of former mobster Enrico de Pettis, who died in a gun duel in 1990. The same caller stated that Cardinal Ugo Poletti, Rome's vicar general at the time, ordered Orlandi to be taken off the street. The tipper, however, did not provide any additional information on Poletti's involvement, nor did he provide any evidence to back up his claim. When forensic experts explored the grave, they discovered not just the Petty's remains, but also numerous more bones.
The police claimed they'd analyzed the remains to see if any belonged to Orlandi at the time, but no findings have been released. Despite all of the hints that have been thrown out to the press since Orlandi's disappearance in the early 1980s, no one has ever been arrested. Anonymous sources have mentioned several Italian mobsters in the news, but none have ever been officially linked to Orlandi. Mehmet Ali Aga's ludicrous assertions were essential in hindering the further investigation into the issue. Bulgarian spies and the KGB have also been blamed for the crime, in addition to the Grey Wolves and a nebulous Masonic organization. Roberto Calvi, one of the suspects, was discovered hanged in London just before Orlandi vanished. Everyone, including prominent members of the Vatican, seems to have an opinion about Emanuela Orlandi's disappearance. The Vatican's leading exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth, believes Orlandi was kidnapped to be shuttled around sex parties and used as a slave. The allegation is debatable, and Amorth has no evidence to back it up, but he is adamant in his conviction. In addition to his theories concerning Orlandi's presumed captivity, Amorth is convinced that someone from the Vatican assisted in her abduction and that she has since died. He told the publication La Stampa, This was a sexually motivated crime. Parties were planned, with the Vatican Gendarmerie serving as the girl's recruiter. Diplomatic staff from a foreign embassy to the Holy See were participating in the network. Emanuela, I feel, became a victim of this circle. Emanuela Orlandi's family has concluded that more than one person is responsible for her abduction, decades after she went. They haven't indicated whether they believe the death was caused by a government or religious organization, but her brother, Pietro Orlandi, finds it inexplicable that no one has come forward with concrete evidence. I'm incapable of accepting injustices, especially when it involves my sister, especially knowing that there are people who know what transpired throughout the years. The right to know the truth and the right to be treated fairly are precious rights to me that no one can ever take away. This brings today's video to an end. If you liked it, please stay tuned and subscribe to Haunted Hook. Take care. Ciao.